Um, so the, the topic of the talk is carbon capture and storage. Um, basically, can we have our cake and eat it? Can we burn fossil fuels without putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? The, uh, the introductory slide um, may look like uh, the problem. It looks like an, a North Sea, um, a typical North Sea uh, oil platform, which of course is producing fossil fuel, which we're going to burn and turn into, into CO2. In fact, uh, this slide was chosen because it's actually potentially part of the solution. Some of you may recognise this. This platform over on the the platform over on the right is um, the is actually a CO2 stripping platform. So it takes natural gas, strips CO2 out of it, which is then injected into the subsurface uh, for safe uh, long-term disposal. So we'll come back to this as an example of what can be done later. So, if you turned up for a talk on carbon capture and storage, and I work, particularly a lot of you appear to be researchers working on uh, sort of climate change uh, related stuff, you don't need to see a slide like this one because you've seen them all before. However, it is traditional to start a talk like this with a slide showing either ever increasing CO2 emissions in the atmosphere or the, uh, the sort of famous hockey stick graph showing temperature. I chose the CO2 one, um, but it does have some points below it uh, which I would like to address. I'm sure you all followed the, uh, the big um, UN climate change conference in Paris in November, December last year. And if you, if you read the summary of the outcomes of that, uh, that conference, then the aim of the, the conference was to uh, produce a, a voluntary agreement to reduce uh, global temperature rise to less than two degrees and to make efforts, whatever they are, to, uh, to keep it to below 1.5 degrees. In order to do that, they suggested we needed to do two things. First of all, change that ever-increasing upward trajectory of um, CO2 emissions into a downward trajectory as soon as possible, which they describe as peaking. And secondly, the, the, the world and individual countries are to aim for what they called net greenhouse gas neutrality. And apparently this term caused a lot of uh, argument in, in the, with the negotiators trying to come up with a good phrase. What they meant, uh, as far as I can work out, is that if you burn fossil fuel in the second half of this century, you burn fossil fuel, you emit CO2, you, are, you will be obliged to remove that same quantity of CO2 from the atmosphere. So any one area or country becomes, on average, uh, neutral in terms of its emissions. Sure. Uh, I take it that means is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we have two. You can stand. So we have two aims um, to reduce emissions as fast as we can and to head for neutrality. Carbon capture and storage is a technology which hopefully will, will aim us in the right direction for both of those. I have, however, got two slides of. Um, rather self-indulgent material which uh, reflects my own take on the, the whole climate change debate, one of which is the issue of ocean acidification. Um, now from, a, from the public's perception, as far as I can see, the whole debate about climate change is about climate change, it's about global warming, if that's what you want to call it. There seems to be very little talk about ocean acidification, um, despite the fact that it's at least, as far as I can tell, at least as big a problem. Um, you burn CO2, it goes into the atmosphere, some of it dissolves in the oceans. Hooray, say some people that's got rid of it. Don't need to worry about that again. Um, wrong. CO2 is a form of carbonic acid. It's a weak acid. It acidifies the oceans. Most marine organisms only have a limited range of tolerance for acidity. Uh, it becomes too, if the oceans become too acidic, they will die. Um, we're starting to see the start of this already. Uh, things like coral reefs are starting to bleach due to a combination of rising global temperatures and increasing acidity. Um, a lot of the world's population rely on fish as their only protein source. And fish are not all that um, tolerant of acidity, so um, the effects of this could be disastrous. And I don't understand why the debate in the public has been so focused on climate change when we have this other uh, very serious problem, which in many ways is easier to understand. I don't, I don't uh, quite follow the logic. And I probably use the term global warming already. It's a terrible term. Um, it's used a lot by the media. It's here to stay. It's not going away. 
One of the problems with global warming is it doesn't sound too bad. Um, I don't know what the weather's like in Cardiff, but assuming it's anything like Edinburgh, getting a bit warmer, that sounds okay to me. Um, it's almost never too hot in Edinburgh, but there's plenty of times it's too cold. Scientists don't use global warming. Um, climate change is much more accurate. Global warming just doesn't cover what's going to happen. Um, one of the predictions for climate change, for example, is that uh, we're going to get rainfall changes, changes in rainfall pattern, which are going to move rainfall from the land onto the oceans. Well, rain on the oceans isn't going to help us. So we're going to end up with water shortages, and I guess we could end up with water wars. I mean, seriously suggested we may end up with water wars. Um, I guess everybody knows about ice caps, obviously the, the, the terrestrial ice caps melting and leading to um, global sea level rise um, and the increase in extreme weather events. Um, I, I, did a, I was on a field trip up to the Lake District a couple of weeks ago and we had to completely rejig the field trip because we couldn't drive up one of the main roads in the Lake District because it was cut in two by Storm Desmond. That was in December, so the damage there is really quite bad. And from a slightly more geological perspective, um, the rate of extinction on the planet at the moment is extremely high. It's, there have been five really big extinction events in the geological past that life has staggered through, and it's been seriously suggested we're now in the sixth one. Something we've taken quite seriously. And the other thing is this phrase, saving the planet. People uh, put their, they put their low energy light bulb into their socket, they say, I'm saving the planet. But I'm sure it have to tell you this, the planet doesn't need saving. It's been here for four and a half billion years, and it's going to continue to go around the sun until eventually the sun expands and fries us all. That's a long, long way off. So what actually are we trying to save? Well, um, how about the human race? That'd be good. Um, but the human race, humans are really adaptable things, yeah? You used to live in caves and eat raw meat, so I guess we could do that again. Well, probably what we're really trying to save is actually our own civilization our incredibly resource and energy intensive civilization that uses electricity and, <coughs> and power for practically everything. And if you've got kids, what you're really trying to say, I think, is your kids, your children's, your children's children. So again, from a geological perspective, if everything goes completely pear-shaped and we wipe out huge numbers of species on this, the face of the planet, well, it doesn't really matter because it's happened a few times in the past and it only takes about five million years for things to recover. Now, that's a lot longer than I'm prepared to wait. Probably most of the people too. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we need to stop carbon dioxide from industrial processes, particularly, or, um, particularly for example, power generation, electricity generation, from uh, reaching the atmosphere. So this graphic uh, tries to explain the basics of carbon capture and storage. Um, it has one major drawback as a graphic. I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. So the idea is simple. We, um, we continue to mine fossil fuel, be it coal, be it oil, be it gas. We take it into uh, thermal power stations, we burn it, we generate electricity. That electricity is captured, so rather than going into the atmosphere, we simply capture it and we take it to some suitable storage location where we can put it into the subsurface, where it's going to stay out of the atmosphere for geological or long long periods of time. In terms of storage, we have three um, sort of typical storage sites. One of them is to use old oil and gas fields. So we've taken lots of hydrocarbons out of these things. There's a certain symmetry to putting the stuff back into them. Makes sense. Oil and gas fields are relatively small in the scheme of things. A typical oil field in the North Sea, five, ten kilometers across. So about the size of a city. The rocks that those oil fields are in are often much, much bigger. So the rocks themselves extend for <coughs> ten, tens or hundreds of kilometres often. They, they've, uh, they've acquired this rather peculiar name, this saline aquifer term. And the storage in those is massive. Um, in the UK it looks like we have enough storage for uh, maybe a couple of hundred years, even if we were to capture all the CO2. So potential storage is really, really pretty big. There's a third one storing CO2 in unmineable coal seams. Now I was going to dismiss that <laughs> as not very important, but I'm reliably told that a large number of people in the room work on that. So maybe I'll, I'll just kind of revise that to, um, it's probably the smaller of the three, but I'm sure it, it could be crucially important. 
The bit I don't like about this graphic, but I really, really can't stand, is the apparent depth scale. So this is obviously the seabed, and we've got our storage apparently only a, a few, or rather a few tens of meters below the surface. That's wrong. Uh, the minimum depth for storage is about a kilometer. kilometer. And a typical depth range for storage is probably the kind of one kilometer down to three or four kilometers. There's no way anybody's going to put CO2 right underneath the ocean uh, as, that, as that figure implies. The artist who drew that deserves a bit of a slap on the wrist, I think. Okay, so we've got a power station, and this emits a flue gas, and that flue gas contains between about 3 and 10, maybe 15% CO2. I guess we could take that flue gas and try and put the whole lot underground, but that's an awful lot of gas, and a lot of it's nitrogen. Um, who wants to bury nitrogen? It makes no sense at all. So you've got to get the CO2 out of that flue gas so that we can reduce the volumes of gas to something sensible. Even when we do that, uh, we still talk about quite large quantities. A, a large power station, uh, there's one just outside Edinburgh where I come from, emits about, uh, when it's fully working, about 10 million tonnes of CO2 a year. So it's quite substantial quantities. Imagine you've got a, so you've got a power station and it burns coal and it emits <coughs> CO2 and you want to stop that reaching the atmosphere. So the, the method you're going to use is called post-combustion capture and the, uh, the actual chemistry is basically absorption. You use some kind of chemical which will absorb CO2 under one set of physical conditions and then allow the CO2 to come off under different physical conditions, change the temperature or the pressure, for example. The most common one is what's usually referred to as amine, top of the list there, monoethyl amine or MEA to its friends. Um, amine stripping is a, a well-established technology um, if you've ever had a can of fizzy drink, which I guess is most of us, that CO2 in your fizzy drink, that was generated, that was, that was separated out from some other gas using this amine stripping technology. So it's, it's well established, it works well. And it, it's the technology used on that intro slide I had of that North Sea, uh, that North Sea oil platform where they're stripping the CO2 out. It works. There are a lot of experimental ones. Huge research effort is going into trying to make this um, more effective and particularly cheaper. So calcium cycle, uh, using chilled ammonia, these are just chemical, chemicals that can absorb CO2. There are also physical methods, so uh, for example designing a membrane that allows CO2 to pass through it but keeps everything else uh, on the other side. So, you, so that's a physical separation method. Most people seem to be using some kind of chemical absorption thing. And this is going to cost money. So absorption or Capture is an expensive bit. Um, basically, it's, you use energy. So all these chemical processes, and also compressing the CO2 once you've got it, put it into a pipeline, this uses energy. So for a typical uh, plant, typical, typical uh, power station, 25% of the power that you generate is going to be absorbed by this process. That's quite a lot, that's quite a major proportion and that means you've got to pay for all that extra fossil fuel which is going to drive all this process and that makes it expensive. If you're going to build a new power station rather than use an old one then um, you've got a couple of other choices. You could still use post-combustion capture but you do have a, a slightly bigger menu to choose from there. Pre-combustion uh, capture is um, essentially you build a, a sort of chemical plant which takes fossil fuel turns it into something called syngas, basically by heating it, uh, you know, um, which is basically carbon monoxide and hydrogen. You then undertake something called the shift reaction, where you react that gas, and you end up with a mixture of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So you chemically turn your, turn your fossil fuel into a mixture of CO2 and hydrogen. Separating out the CO2 is now easy. What's left is hydrogen. You build your, you, you then fire your power station using hydrogen, which of course only produces water. So you end up with totally clean combustion. Another alternative is to burn the fossil fuel in pure oxygen. So most power stations just use air, which of course is mostly nitrogen. So if you separate, if you, if you uh, produce large quantities of oxygen and burn the fossil fuel in oxygen, you basically produce an exhaust gas, which is CO2 and water. Water is easy to get rid of just leaves you pure CO2. The, the hard bit then, of course, is making the 
gigatons or, or the megatons of oxygen that you need to feed the, uh, feed the power station with. That's where the energy goes, that's where the cost comes from. And um, one of the problems they've actually faced with this is that a lot of fossil fuels, when they're burned in a pure oxygen flame, the flames are so hot they melt most industrial materials. So they've had problems with the burners actually melting. Well, what they do for that is they, they recycle some of the flue gas back into the oxygen stream to dilute the oxygen. Um, so you end up with something which is, is not quite so hot burning. Okay, so we've got a power station and that's generated. Um, we, we now have a, a stream of CO2 um, in the, possibly the millions of tonnes a year range, depending on the size of the station. If you're really lucky, your power station sits on the perfect geology and you can just drill a hole below the power station and pump the stuff into the ground. The chances of that happening are remote, which means you're going to have to move the CO2 to somewhere with better storage. So this is obviously a map of the UK. The red dots, the red dots on shore are um, CO2 sources. The bigger the dot, the bigger the source. You can see there's a few hanging around in South Wales. The yellow dots out in the out in the North Sea are old oil fields, or current, or some of them are current, many of them reaching the end of their lives. So oil fields, these potential stores. The, uh, the purple diamond things, they are old gas fields, those are also potential stores. So all our store all our sources are onshore. Most of our good storage is offshore, which means you've got to move stuff. That's not too difficult. Um, the North Sea is covered in pipelines. The floor of the North Sea is covered in pipelines. All those black lines, all those black lines, these are pipelines carrying oil and gas around underneath the North Sea. So perfectly possible to move large amounts of gas around the, around the North Sea. Now, it's just to have a quick look at the situation in, in Wales, um, I don't think you're ever going to get large quantities of storage onshore in Wales. Now, I know some of you, as I've said, we're looking at coal storage, but CCS has had a bad press with the public, and certainly in places like the, the Netherlands and Germany, people just do not want CO2 storing on, on shore anywhere near where they live. So I think, even, if, even technologically, technically it may work perfectly, but I think, my personal opinion, you're going to have a big problem with the public. Which begs the question, where's the nearest offshore storage? Well, you've got plenty of water around you, um, the Celtic Sea and St George's Channel, there may be storage there. Um, the geology there isn't really all that well known. The reason why the, the geology is not very well known is that um, the only people who can afford to drill boreholes to find out what's down there are the oil companies. Boreholes cost a lot of money. They're the only people with that kind of money. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars to drill a single borehole. So the oil companies come along, they drill a few boreholes, they find the geology is not suitable for finding oil and gas, they go somewhere else. So we probably know more about the, the, the North Sea geology because of all the drilling than any other offshore area in the whole world. But this area around here, which is close to, to where we are now, we know very little about that. So in the short term, I, th I think it's going to be relatively difficult to find um, storage which is close. However, you do have some gas fields which are not that far away. These, uh, these two yellow squares over there, they're the, usually referred to as the Morecambe Bay gas fields. There's a, a small cluster of gas fields. Um, they're not at the end of their life yet, but they, they haven't got that long to go, and they'd be potential storage sites. All you'd have to do would be to build a pipeline from here, all the way down Wales, up to the north. And that's, that's probably a lot easier than trying to build a pipeline across the land, that's really difficult. Laying pipelines on the seafloor is actually standard technology, people do it all the time. And if you compare the length of that purple line to some of the black ones in the North Sea, that pipeline length is by no means predictable. So, uh, looking at my crystal ball, and we all know how difficult it is to look into the future, that would be uh, my sort of random guess as to, as to where the easiest possible storage is from this end of the country. I wait the questions with, with interest to be told I'm completely wrong. Okay, so this, this is just a detailed map of those um, Morecambe Bay gas fields. So here's the North Wales coastline down here. You can see pipelines bringing, bringing gas onto shore for processing. Um, some of it's landed in the south of the Lake District, some of it's landed in North Wales. 
What else might we want to use these gas fields for? Is there anything else you can use an old gas field for? And the answer is yes. One option is to store methane gas in them. So uh, methane gas obviously is used extensively. Um, it's used, or its price varies quite dramatically throughout the year. It's quite cheap to buy in the summer when nobody's heating their houses. It's very expensive to buy in the winter when everybody wants it. So what some people do is they, they buy methane gas in the summer when the price is low. They inject it into the subsurface in old oil or gas fields. Then in the winter when the price is high, they take the stuff back out and they sell it. So that's done commercially on the other side of the country, off the Yorkshire coast. There's an old gas field there, uh, which they've been doing that to for about the last 20 years. Um, so, so you could use these old, these old fields for that. There's also a possibility of storing hydrogen. Now, we don't use hydrogen much at the moment um, in the UK, but there are hydrogen networks in some industrial areas, such as Teesside, for example, has a hydrogen pipeline network. Hydrogen has the merit, as you all know, that when you burn it, you only get water. So if you have, for example, a central heating boiler, uh, and there must be millions of central heating boilers in the UK, if you were to convert those to burning hydrogen instead of methane, each of the boilers, at the, each individual boiler would only emit water, and we need to we need to store hydrogen because we have to make it. There's no natural source of hydrogen. So it's uh, a lot of people now are looking very seriously at whether we can store huge quantities of hydrogen. And these old gas fields would be just fine. Simply inject it in when we're when we've got more than we need. Take it out when we need it. As for geothermal, um, now again, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not an expert in geothermal power. Because all our storage is offshore, I don't think we're going to have a problem. As far as I'm aware, geothermal power is usually used very close to where you're, you're taking it from. So I don't see a conflict there. Um, and in terms of these other, these other storage uh, possibilities, there are a lot of depleted gas fields. Uh, there's no shortage of even in the Morecambe Bay area, there's quite a few. Uh, Ireland has, uh, area has got one as well, a Kinsale gas field. So they're, con they're considering storing methane gas in that. Um, there are a lot of gas fields, mostly in the um, mostly in the, English, in the in the southern north. Side. So I think there's probably enough storage for everybody. Okay, so we've got our CO2. We've transported it to somewhere. We're going to drill a borehole, and we're going to inject it into the subsurface, into seemingly solid rock. Now I don't know how many people here are geologists, so if there are any, then I apologise. Um, the kind of rock that we're going to put the CO2 in is the kind of rock that you could build St Pancras Station with. As a random example of a building everybody probably knows, that's the one that's pretended to be King's Cross Station in the Harry Potter movies, if you remember that. So St Pancras Station is built of a, built of a reddish brown sandstone. Uh, but it's a rock that started life as a sand, hence the name. It's now a rock, it's now a stone, sandstone. Although it looks solid, although you can build a perfectly good building with it, if you look at it closely, you find the rock has, has pore space, it has spaces. To study them, what we do is we get a bit of the rock, we impregnate it with a resin to hold it together, and we cut a, a very thin slice, which we can then pop on a light microscope and have a look at. And this is what the photograph shows. The, uh, the white things are individual sand grains. But what we're interested in here is the spaces between them. Now, in this particular one, the blue, uh, we, we've used a blue coloured resin to hold this rock together. So the blue is pore space, it's space between the grains. Now, in the subsurface, that will be full of water. Once you blow the water table, which is very near the surface, that will be full of water. We're going to inject CO2 into that, into that rock. We're going to push that water out of the way. And we're going to fill those tiny spaces Full of, full of carbon dioxide. Just to, to point out the scale, this blue scale bar at the bottom is a millimeter. So the spaces we're looking at are way less than a millimeter, most of them. And the spaces between the spaces are measured in microns. But we can put uh, millions of tons of CO2 into a rock like that. And it's the same kind of rock that the oil companies get their oil and gas out of. Exactly the same kind. There is sometimes a misconception amongst non-geologists, that oil and, oil and gas companies find oil and gas in like, in like big caves, there's huge voids, and they just suck the oil and gas out. 
It's not true. It comes out of very much solid rock, very much like this one. So we need, we need this rock. We're going to put the, um, the carbon dioxide in. It's referred to as a reservoir. And we need two other components. And these components are absolutely identical to the, to the components we would find in a, in a normal oil or gas field. So we need a reservoir rock. When we put the CO2 into a reservoir rock, it's buoyant compared to the, the water that's down there, which means it's going to try to rise up. And if we're not careful, it's going to end up at the surface. So we need a rock layer that the CO2 can't get through. That's referred to as a seal. It has to be on top of the reservoir. So we have our, our reservoir in yellow and our seal in grey. So we inject the CO2 into here, perhaps down here, and it will, it will move under buoyancy and pull at this, this high point. And we need that kind of three-dimensional, well, obviously on the, on the slide 2D, but in reality we need this kind of three-dimensional structure known as a trap, which will hold the CO2 into a relatively small space where we can keep an eye on it. And again, that small space might be five or ten kilometres across, so they're not, they're not tiny. Reservoir seal trap, they're the three components we need for storage. This is what keeps people awake at night if they're, if they're CO2 storage geologists, the geologist nightmare. So this is a cross section going down into the earth. Um, we've got a, a borehole, we drill down into this, this shallow trap. We've injected CO2, that's that sort of bluish, bluish colour. We've put a bit too much in, the CO2 has spilled out, it's found some natural fractures, it's linked, it's got into an aquifer perhaps which has got uh, drinking water in which is most definitely something we're trying to avoid and it's reached the surface and it's back out it's difficult to overemphasize exactly how much effort is being put in to stop that happening to make sure that when we put co2 in the subsurface it stays there but there is there is one uh, misconception about ccs uh, which you encounter quite often and that's the idea that we can we can have a hundred percent of this stuff come back to the surface it simply isn't possible. Um, remember this, this thing about the, the fact the spaces we're putting the CO2 in are really small, way below a millimetre, so micron size spaces. Um, we get a lot of what's called capillary trapping because of surface tension effects. So once the CO2 goes into the rocks, maybe about 50% of it in any one volume can never be recovered. And by the time the CO2 has worked its way up to the surface at some devious leakage pathway, um, it's very unlikely that very much of it's going to get out, uh, which is which is encouraging. At the moment, I'm actually working on an EU-funded project which is looking at what we would do if this happened. What, what, what would we actually do? Um, turns out the oil and gas industry have a whole armour, uh, a whole sort of array of techniques that they've developed um, over the years for dealing with oil and gas leaks. Many of those will work with CO2. So in actual fact, we're actually quite well prepared if this happens, which most people it won't. Of course, if it does happen, you might end up with something that looks a bit like this. So this is in uh, Utah, this is in the States. Um, that's my wife enjoying one of the few tourist attractions in this neck of the woods. Um, Crystal Geyser, as it's called, is a cold water geyser um, driven by CO2 pressure. So that's water shooting into the air. It's driven by the same mechanism as if you got a can of Coke, gave it a really good shake and pulled the, open the tin. Just, just water blown into the air by CO2 pressure. Totally natural CO2, nobody's been storing anything here. It, it's actually, the, the leak itself, or the, the geyser itself, is actually a, um, an old oil borehole. Uh, maybe sort of 70 or 80 years ago, some guys turned up, drilled, hoping to find oil, just found a load of fizzy water, which they obviously weren't very happy with. Um, basically left it leaking. I don't know if you can see, inside that plume of water, there's a, not really, not very really easy to see, there's a, there's a steel tube which is about this, this diameter and about, about, sort of about chest height on me. That's put there by the tourist board because it makes the eruption more dramatic when it goes off. Um, it goes off two or three times a day. You get tourists driving down there, down this dirt road to go look at it. The point about this, I guess, is that there are no dead tourists lying around this, despite the fact that it's emitting something like 20,000 tonnes of CO2 every year. There are no bleaching cow skeletons like in sort of you know cartoons and stuff. The CO2 is harmless, 
in this context because it simply blows away. It's not, it's not confined. If the CO2 is confined, if it comes up in your basement, for example, then it's an asphyxiant and it's poisonous, you've got a problem. But in a place like this, a CO2 leak is um, not only harmless, but actually a tourist attraction. I, th I think there's a limit as to how many tourist attractions like this the world would want. Um, I think one is more than sufficient, but uh, I guess it makes a point. So, how long do we need to, do we need to actually store the CO2 for? Well, the, um, the European Union's um, lawmakers have decided that the, the storage has to be permanent. Now, I don't, again, I don't know who, how many geologists we have in the room, but permanent is a bit of a non-concept in geology. Um, I'll give you a random example. The North Atlantic is only 50 million years old. And in another couple of hundred million years, it will probably close itself, and that will be the end of that. So if the North Atlantic isn't permanent, I don't really see why we should have to store CO2 permanently. It seems completely absurd. So how long do we need to store it for? Well, one way, or the only way to really get a, a sensible number is to do some modelling. So um, this is not my modelling, needless to say. What the graph shows is it shows atmospheric CO2 concentration through time, modelled, obviously, from around now-ish. Oops. Oh, oh, thank you. Around around and nourish way into the future if we just keep on burning fossil fuel and burning and burning and burning we get that top curve so it goes up and up and up then it stops and drops back down again not quite sure why it stops either we run out of fossil fuel or we go extinct it must be one of the two then natural processes just take the level uh, back down to I guess eventually back down to the, the pre-human level it's going to take a while. The other curves show what happens if you capture the CO2, put it into storage, but then it, it leaks in varying, it leaks after various amounts of time. So there's curves there for about 500 years, about 1,000 years. In order to keep the CO2 level at the kind of levels are after, about 450 ppm, you need storage for 7,200 years on that plot. That's the green curve. So round that off. 10,000 years. So nearly everybody is aiming for storage for 10,000 years. That's a very long time for a person and a very, very short time geologically. It's no time at all. It's almost instantaneous geologically. So, how much experience have we got of actual gas storage? Or oh, how much experience have we got of storing anything, really? I guess you could claim that the oldest containers in the world are the pyramids, and they've mostly leaked. So nearly everybody agrees you can't build a container that's going to hold pressurised gas for 10,000 years. That's just not an option. And we've only got about, we've got about 30 or 40 years of experience of actually putting stuff into geological storage. But the good news is that natural geological storage that holds oil and gas operates for tens of millions of years. This graph on the bottom of the a log scale shows that the natural geological storage way out there, way longer than we need. And uh, just like that crystal geyser, the place I just showed a photo of, um, we have natural CO2 accumulations, and, and some of those have been around for millions of years as well. So we're pretty convinced that this is going to work. Nearly every geologist that I know uh, thinks this is going to work. It's, it's gonna, it's, the storage is, is really very straightforward. How much experience in this do we have? Well, uh, if you remember my opening slide, the one showing the oil platform, um, we have a little, not as much as we'd like, but we have a little experience. So this is that oil field, it's in the, the Norwegian part of the North Sea, it's called the Sleipner Field. We have a oil platform, which is drilled down to an oil field. These, are, these black things are the, are the oil uh, the wells, the boreholes drilled down. They, they extract gas from that, from that aquifer, uh, from that reservoir, it's about two and a half kilometres depth. They bring the gas to the surface. They can't sell it immediately because it contains about 10% CO2. The most you can put into a gas network is 4%. So they have to strip that 6% extra CO2 out. Now in the past they just poured it into the atmosphere, what people usually do with excess CO2. But the Norwegians have this massive tax on offshore CO2 emissions. So, it's, uh, so what they did is they 
drilled another borehole into a suitable sandstone at a, about 800 metres depth or so. And they're injecting that CO2 into that sandstone at a rate of about a million tonnes a year. And they've been doing this for about 20 years now. So um, they've injected about 20 million tonnes. It's still down there, which is good. And the whole world has been watching this as the um, as, as a sort of test case almost. There's been a whole a, a whole lot of science done on this with monitoring and you know, basically what happens when you do this. There's another technology that we can use. Um, there's another technology which we can use, um, which gives us experience, and that's called enhanced oil recovery. Now, when a when an oil company walks away from an oil field and says it's empty, it isn't really empty. Um, a lot of the oils left in the ground, uh, often about 50%, a really quite a large quantity. And a lot of effort's been put into developing methods, technology, to get a bit of extra oil out. One of those technologies is, is injecting CO2 into the reservoir. So that's good because it gets rid of CO2, but of course it does produce more fossil fuel, which is not really the aim of the exercise. However, it does build, it does allow you to, for example, build infrastructure, which costs money, someone's got to pay for all this, and it builds experience and it builds confidence that all this whole technology works. So this enhanced oil recovery thing is a very valuable thing. And it's been suggested we might actually get it to work in the North Sea, uh, which would um, be a major step forward. So we're going to put CO2 into the subsurface, and um, how are we going to know what's happening down there? It's going to be a kilometre down, you can't, you can't see it. But we have a technique, um, everybody is probably familiar with ultrasound, so anybody who's had a baby in the last 20 years, probably had an ultrasound scan where you can see the little baby. Yeah? Well, you can use that exact method to get pictures of rocks in the subsurface. You don't use a teeny weeny little ultrasound noise, you need a, a big bang to send sound waves down. But exact same method works. The left hand side of the thing shows an image generated using this method of the geology below that storage site, that, that site in the field I was just talking about. That's the top of the reservoir. That's the bottom. That's what it looked like before they put any CO2 in. I should just hasten to add that's not the seabed. The seabed would be way, way out of the room on this scale. That is what it looked like after we put two million tons in. Two million tons of CO2. It's clearly visible. And you can you can kind of forward model this to work out exactly how much CO2 there is in the subsurface. The one on the right, in case you're wondering, is just a mathematical subtraction of one image from the other. Um, so that you can basically see what's changed. And it's useful for, for just checking the seal, that rock at the top, to make sure we've got no CO2 that's actually leaking. Okay, so CCS might um, allow a reduction in the ever-increasing trajectory of CO2 emissions. How about this greenhouse gas neutrality business? Because that's basically, we're still, we're still burning fossil fuel. We're not going to... We can never capture all the CO2 in a flue gas, you always lose a bit into the atmosphere. That's where this bio-CCS thing comes in. Um, bio-CCS has two, I guess, two main things. Many power stations will work, many modern or present-day power stations will work with a few percent of uh, biological material substituted for the fossil fuel. So many, many power stations co-fire, as it's called, with about 5% of wood chips or whatever they're using. If you were to have a power station which is using exclusively biological material what you're, and, and then capturing CO2 and burying it, what you're effectively doing is you're taking atmospheric CO2 via the plant material, biological material, and you're burying it. You're taking CO2 directly out of the atmosphere, putting it into geological storage. So it's one of the few technologies we have which could draw down atmospheric CO2 levels in, seri in, in kind of serious quantities which if we're after net greenhouse gas neutrality could be a very useful tool indeed. There are all sorts of issues with um, this kind of thing. You've got to have some land that nobody else is using. Uh, you obviously need to fertilise the land. It's not a panacea. Um, it's, it's been suggested that uh, ryegrass, it's a picture of some ryegrass. Ryegrass will grow well in Wales. There's certainly been a scheme. Um, people have suggested it. It could, be, it could be done commercially here. Um, 
So, when, when we were discussing what was going to be in this talk, one of the things that was requested was some thoughts about LNG, liquefied natural gas. And I was a bit puzzled by this because we don't have LNG in Scotland. I said, well, what's this got to why, why are people so interested? Uh, a quick a bit of Googling on, um, on LNG, um, South Wales, quickly um, produced the answers. There's been obviously a lot of controversy about the Milford Haven um, terminal. If you've got gas on the wrong side of the world to your market, so you've got gas in the Middle East and you want to move it to Europe, um, because, because the gas, obviously the gas has very low density, um, you need to compress it massively and cool it in order to get enough of it onto a ship to make it work well. That uses a lot of energy. You've got to compress it, that uses energy. You've got to cool it, that uses energy. When it arrives, you've got to heat it back up again, that uses energy. What that means is that the footprint, the carbon footprint of uh, a gas-fired power station that's burning LNG is way higher than you'd expect. Now the people who promote uh, gas as a fuel, they promote gas as a clean fossil fuel. It's not really clean, it's just the least dirty of the fossil fuels. But with LNG, um, actually it's not clean at all. And what the graph shows is it shows carbon footprint. I'm afraid the, um, the axes have just vanished off the side of the slide. But the vertical axis is, is carbon footprint. It's a mass of CO2 per unit of electricity generated. And it's split into two components. The pink, the, the top kind of pinky colour, that's the, the smokestack emission. That's the emission you get by burning your fuel. So for coal, you get a lot of smokestack emission. The red stuff, that's the carbon footprint of actually getting the coal to the power station, mining it, transporting it, preparing it. So for coal, most of the emission is up the smokestack and the, the, the sort of preparation it is a relatively small part. For gas, this is calculated for a 20% LNG component, so 80% <coughs> normal gas, 20% LNG. That preparation footprint massively dominates. The smokestack emission is smaller, as you'd expect, but the overall emissions are about the same. Now, if you do that calculation for 25% LNG, or worse still, 100, you're going to find that there's no way is gas a clean fuel. Far, far, we'd be better off burning coal. So, this is my conclusion slide. Um, most of you, I think, are scientists. So most of you are familiar with the fact that the traditional, traditional conclusion slide is a slide that says conclusions along the top and then a series of bullet points. So in a break with tradition, I have a picture. Uh, many people will have heard of the hydrogen economy. Uh, the idea is that at the moment uh, we use our, our, our basic m uh, means of moving energy around is our electricity and methane gas okay. and coal. I mean, these are our main kind of uh, ways of storing and moving electricity. Uh, moving energy. It's been suggested that in the future we will we'll move to hydrogen. Now on my picture I very deliberately have a set of windmills and some wave some wave things because let nobody say that I that this guy from Edinburgh turned up and said that CCS is going to solve all our climate problems. Because it isn't. We're going to need everything. So that's why I have these little pictures added onto onto my slide here to make sure just to remind us photovoltaics tides, you name it, we're probably going to need it and use it. But CC has, CCS has a role to play. We can continue to extract fossil fuel, we can turn it into electricity, provided we capture the CO2, put it back into the subsurface. We can also turn fossil fuel in, into, in industrial plants into hydrogen. Again, capture the CO2, put it into geological, service, uh, geological storage. What do we do with our hydrogen? Well, you can put it to a gas turbine and generate clean electricity. You can use a fuel cell and turn it into clean electricity. Potentially, you can put it in a car, if you don't have to car with a battery. Um, you can pipe it into people's houses for all those millions of central heating boilers so they can heat their houses. You can even put it in aeroplanes. But I'm not sure I'd want to be the first person in a hydrogen-powered aeroplane. I guess that's why they pay test pilots a lot more than I get. Um, but that's it. CCS, um, basically have your cake and eat it, hopefully. Thank you.